Welcome to Redis Days India. My name is Simon Prickett and I'm the Principal Developer Advocate at Redis. In this session, we'll cover how to use Redis Stacks JSON and search capabilities. We'll look at a demonstration of vector similarity search and we'll use a little bit of Python, but you don't need to really know it to be successful with this session. So I'm Simon, I'll be introducing Redis Stack and Redis Insight, which is a graphical tool for visualizing and managing data in Redis. I'll focus on storing, updating, and querying data stored as JSON documents in Redis Stack. Brian Samboden is a senior developer advocate at Redis and the author of the Redis Ohm Spring client for Redis. Brian will introduce the concept of vector similarity search and will demonstrate how to prepare store and query vector data in Redis stack. In this part of the workshop, we'll begin by introducing Redis stack and Redis insight. We'll then look at how we're going to model our document data in the Redis stack database. We'll cover how to store and update JSON documents and how to query them. We'll do so through a series of Redis command uh, examples, and then also through some Python code in a Flask application. What is Redis Stack? It's a Redis core with additional capabilities. There's search, JSON, some extra probabilistic data structures, and a time series. In this session, we're gonna focus in on those search and JSON capabilities. And we'll be doing that with Redis Insight over there on the left. Redis Insight is a desktop application that provides a graphical interface to view and manage data in Redis. It's an ideal companion to Redis Stack as it's built to work with those additional capabilities that we'll see in this session. We're gonna explore these concepts in the context of Redis Bike Company, a reseller of bicycles in India. This company sells all sorts of bikes from various manufacturers and it has several stores scattered across the country. We'll store details of each bike and each store in Redis as their own JSON document. Once we have our data organized in Redis, I'll show you how to use Redis Stack's search capability to ask complex questions about the data set. Let's begin by looking at the data model for our stores. I want to organize these so that each store has its own document in Redis and each of those documents will be a JSON document. We'll keep the same schema for each store, but because Redis is a schemaless data store, we don't have to do this. First off, I'm going to look at the key that I'm using. So as a key value data store, we need to keep a JSON document at a given Redis key. I'm going to organize my key space. So all keys for this application will begin with Redis bike co colon. That'll be my sort of application wide prefix. Then I'm going to use store colon to indicate that this is a store. And then I'm going to use a unique code for that store. So here we have the Mumbai store. Uh, that's going to have the store code MU. So our full key is Redis Byte Co colon store colon MU. This will come in handy later when we look at indexing. But for now, let's just say we're going to keep the keys organized and use this pattern. Inside that key, I want to store a JSON document. And I'm going to use Redis Stack's JSON capability to do this. This will allow us to query parts of that document, update it atomically, and do all sorts of extra things that are unique to the JSON capability. So inside there, we're just storing a JSON document. For each store, I want a store code and a store name. So we'll call this one Mumbai. It has an address that has the usual components you'd expect. So a street and a city and a state and a pin and a country. All of our stores will be in India. So they'll all have pins, they'll all have states. Uh, these objects will look the same, but remember they don't have to. There's no fixed schema here. You know, just because we're calling the key Redis Byte Co colon store, we can store any shape data that we like in there. Then I'm also going to keep a position, so a longitude comma latitude position. And later on, we'll see how that allows me to do some geo searching. So find stores near a given position. I'm also going to have an array of amenities down the bottom there. So each of our stores may provide different things. So some may do bike repairs, some may have a car park. This one also has Wi-Fi and a cafe. 
So we'll have several stores and this is what they're going to look like. The other entity, if you like that, we are going to keep data about in Redis here, again in JSON documents, is the bikes. So different types of bicycle that we sell in our various stores. Here I'm going to use a similar key naming strategy. I'm going to do Redis Bike Co colon as my prefix for the whole application. Then bike colon as I'm storing a bike. And then I'm going to use a stock code or again, some sort of unique identifier as the final part of the key. So I've got RBC 00003 here for Redis Bike Co and it's bike number three. Inside there, I've got a JSON object and that is going to contain the fields that you see on the screen. So we have that stock code. We want a model. So what the name of the bike is, this one's called a Kirk. It's by a company called Bold Bicycles. So they're the brand. We need a price. So 24,999 rupees for this bike. And I'm going to store some other things that you can imagine are sort of uh, tags or ways of categorizing data. So I want to store a type for the bike. Is it a mountain bike? Is it a road bike? In this case, it's a kid's bike. Then I want to store some specifications about the bike and I've decided to keep those tidy inside a sub object. So we've got uh, what material is the bike made of? This one's alloy. How much does it weigh? That's a numeric field. It weighs 7.8, I guess, kilos. And then down the bottom, we have a field that's slightly different from the others. So every other field here is kind of a number or a sort of tag value. They're gonna have very specific uh, values in there. And then down the bottom, we've got something that is more free text. So it's a general description of the bike that might include you know, what it feels like to ride it, call out some accessories that come with it, who it's most suitable for, um, what sort of terrain it's particularly good for, if it's easy to take apart and put back together again, if you have to transport it, that sort of thing. So that field is a little bit different. It's a long paragraph of text. And when we come to do indexing and searching of these with the Redis stack search capability, we'll see how that's treated different from these other fields that have uh, a more set of predetermined set of values. So, you know, we, we know that we carry 10 different brands. There'll be 10 different brands in the brand field. It'll be bold or it'll be uh, one of the other brands that we carry. And similarly for types, it will be you know, kids bikes or mountain bike or road bike or gravel bike or whatever the different types of bike that we have are. So we'll come back to that and see how to index that. But what I wanna do next is move on to looking at how to get this data up and running in a Redis instance and make some basic sort of set and update queries over it. If you'd like to follow along with the data and code from this workshop, we've provided it all for you in a GitHub repository and the URL is on the screen. We've also provided full instructions for how to get started and load the data into a Redis instance. You'll need Docker Desktop, Python 3, and a copy of Redis Insight in order to be successful. If you need help or support, you're not alone. We'd encourage you to join our Discord at discord.gg slash redis. There's a dedicated channel for supporting this workshop. And there's also the wider community where you can ask all of your Redis questions, engage with students on Redis University courses, or just promote your own projects. So let's dive in and move on to actually working with some of this data in a Redis instance. Moving to the terminal here, I've gone ahead and cloned the GitHub repo to my machine. So let's see what we get. Here I have all of the files that were in the GitHub repo. And what we're most interested in at the moment is this data folder here that contains the source documents we want to load into Redis. And then we've got a data loader.py, a Python script that will do that job for us. And we've got a Docker compose file. So to make it easy for you, we have provided Redis as a Docker Compose. So you can just do Docker Compose up and it will pull the container image and start to run it on your local machine. So I'll do that right now. So I'll do Docker Compose up and I'll do minus D, which gets me my terminal back afterwards and runs the container in the background. So let's let that get up and running. 
You may find that yours has to pull the container from Docker Hub first. I've done this before, so mine was local. Now, we've got a Redis instance up and running. We need to put some files into it, so some JSON documents. And let's swap over to VS Code here and look at what's in that data folder. So here in the data folder, there are two documents. There's store data and byte data. And as you might suspect, the store data file contains data about every one of our stores. So it's a JSON object. And then at the root, it has this array called data. And here's the data model for the Chennai store, for example. So as we saw earlier, it has a store code and a store name, and then it has those different address fields and a position so we can locate it on a map. And then it has that array of amenities, so things that the store provides. We have a few of these stores. So we have uh, Kochi here, we have uh, Bengaluru, we have Mumbai, and so forth. Each one has pretty much the same schema, but they don't have to. You remember, Redis isn't going to enforce the schema inside a given JSON document. So what we need to do is translate this single file that contains a bunch of store objects into individual documents in Redis. And that's one of the things our data loader will do for us. The other thing it's going to do is basically the same job for the bikes. So while we have a few stores, we actually have quite a lot of bikes. We sell lots of different bikes. And again, we have this data array here and inside there is an object and each object contains the details of a given bike. So it's stock code, that's its unique identity, uh, the model, the brand, the price, and then some other things we talked about earlier. So type and specs, and then this free text description field, which is a longer form field that we can do some searching on. So each of these objects in this file also needs to become its own bike document in Redis. So that's how our data is presented to us in GitHub. We're going to run the data loader to convert it into documents in Redis that live at keys. And we're not going to worry about how that works just now. So I'm going to go ahead and run the data loader. In this project, I'm using the Poetry Dependency Management tool. So I've already installed my dependencies. Uh, if you're familiar with that tool, those are listed in this pyproject.toml file. Then what I can do having done that is do poetry run python and data loader.py like this. And what we'll see happening is it will load the data into Redis. So there it goes. Um, all of our data is now in Redis. And as you can see, what it's done is it's output for each thing it's put into Redis, the key name and then a summary of what the document was. So we can expect, for example, the classic wheels Phobos to be Redis Bike Co colon bike colon RBC 00044. That's its key in Redis. So this is great. We loaded all the data. Um, what we should probably do now is take a look at what that looks like inside Redis. And for that, we're going to switch to Redis Insight. Redis Insight is the official graphical user interface for Redis. It enables us to visualize and manage data stored in Redis instances, and it understands those extra features that come with Redis Stack. That makes it perfect for this project. It's available for free from our website, or you can get it from various other places. I'm on a Macintosh, so I've found it here in the App Store. It's also available for the Windows and Linux operating systems. So I have it started here. Let's bring it onto the screen and remove a couple of other things. So what you'll see when you start Redis Insight is a list of databases that you've previously configured, or if you don't have any, you'll be encouraged to create a new connection. Let's see what that looks like if you're using our Docker solution provided with this workshop. So you'd click the Add Redis Database button and the majority of the details here don't need to be changed if you're using the Docker solution that we provided. It exposes Redis on the local host at port 6379, which are the defaults. 
You might want to change this alias here. That's just a name that appears in the list of databases. So call it Redis Days India or something meaningful to you. And you do not need to provide a username or a password or change anything else. I'll cancel this because I've already configured mine. So I'm going to click on Redis Days India here. And we've connected to Redis. So here in Redis, I can see that Redis Insight has given me a view of all of my keys. So I have 116 keys in the data store here. They're taking up in total about two megabytes of 2.4 megabytes of memory. And I can see that these keys are all of type JSON. They're all JSON documents. If we scroll down here, that everything's a JSON document. And we have two different sorts of things. So we have each of those entities from our data model and our data loader. I have a store and I have a bike. So if I go ahead and click on the store there, what we can expect to see is Redis Insight loads the data from the JSON document and renders it out for us. And I can click on, for example, amenities here and see the details of that, or I can expand the address. So this isn't a read-only view. Um, with the connection that I've got, I can go ahead and edit these values. So I could, for example, click in here and change the city to somewhere else, but I won't do that. I could actually change the structure of the document. I can delete something here and I can also add additional things. So I could click in here to add some extra JSON. Again, we're not going to do that for now. We're going to keep these documents as they are. So closing this down for a moment, what we'll see here is it's a big list of keys. And what we wanted to do was organize our keys somehow. So we had a key naming strategy. We use Redis Byte Co colon store for all the stores and Redis Byte Co colon bike for each bike. And then after that, each store had a unique store code. So KA, you see there. And each bike had a unique stock code. So RBC00103 there. The benefit of doing this uh, specifically with this tool, but it's just generally a great idea for organizing your key space is I can swap over to this tree view here. So if I swap to the tree view, you'll now see we've got some control over looking at the data. I can see that I've got 111 bikes. So keys that begin with Redis Bike Co, colon bike, colon star. And I've got five stores. So if I then go into here, I can ask Insight what keys begin with Redis Bike Co, colon store, and it will get me those. I can open this one, and this will be our Chennai store. And I can see the document as before. So this is a much more intuitive way of browsing your keys. And it does require you to be organized and think about how you name your keys. So again, Redis Bike Co, colon store, colon CH, a good key naming strategy. It's descriptive and it allows this tool to help us. I am then going to go and look at a bike. So let's pull one of these bikes. And you'll see in here, again, we have a similar thing. We have JSON document, we can edit it. We have this longer bit of text that the bike has. And we can also see some additional information about each key. So none of our keys have a time to live set in Redis. You can expire anything that is at a Redis key. So in this case, the entire JSON document, we could expire if we wanted a cache-like functionality. Without that, so setting no limit, this will stay around forever. So we're not going to have this expire after a certain period of time, but that might be useful in other scenarios. We can also see how big this key is, how much space it's taking up in Redis. So just over one kilobyte to store this JSON document. And I can do some other useful things. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy that key name into the clipboard for the moment. And then we're gonna look at another view in Insight. So this is all graphical point and click, but what if I wanna work with Redis commands? There's a couple of ways I can do that. I can bring up a CLI here and you've got essentially the same CLI that you might be familiar with if you've typed the Redis dash CLI command into your terminal on your machine before. That accepts Redis commands. We're not gonna use that today. What we're gonna use is over here, there's a workbench. And the workbench is a more advanced command editor. It has some help. It displays the results nicely. 
And I can run arbitrary Redis commands in there and get some help whilst typing them. So the command to get a JSON document is a JSON dot, and you'll see it's already helping me, dot get. And then I need to give it a key name. So we'll paste that key name for byte 23. And then I need to give it a path. So what is this? This is a JSON path. It's which bit of the document that we want to get. So with the JSON capability in stack, we don't have to get the entire document. We can just get individual parts of it and we'll see how to do that shortly. But for now, I'm gonna use the path dollar, which is the root, basically means get me everything. I'm gonna click on play over here to run it. That command runs and you'll see again, I've got the results from running that command. And if I wanna get rid of that, I can just go ahead and delete it here. So next thing to do is I want to show you some concepts for working with JSON documents in Redis. So working with individual JSON documents to begin with, then we'll move on to look at how to work with multiple documents and performing search queries. Let's now explore how to retrieve and update data stored in Redis inside JSON documents. Again, to make this easy for you, we've created what's called a Redis Insight Tutorial and it's in the GitHub repository for this workshop. So what you'll need to do is go ahead and down here at the bottom in the workbench in Redis Insight, there is a tutorial section. Some of these come with Redis Insight and there's a section here, my tutorials for additional ones. So what you'll need to do if you wanna try this yourself is click on the upload tutorial button and then simply drop the zip file for the tutorial from the GitHub repository that you've cloned to your machine here into Insight and it will load it and you will get an extra tutorial here in the tree. I've already gone ahead and done this. So you can see here I've got Redis Days India. I can expand this out and we've got Redis Byteco. So this is our tutorial we wanna look at. And there's two sections to it. We'll begin with managing JSON documents. How these work is I have a tutorial here and over there on the left, we have the steps for it. I can click the step and it will pre-populate the correct Redis command that we need into the workbench for us. Then we'll run it and see the results. So here's one we kind of already looked at, retrieve the entire document for a bike. So here I'm using json.get, my command, the full key name of the bike that I want to retrieve, so bike with the code ending in one, and then a JSON path for what I want to retrieve. So dollar is the entire document. Click the button there, and what you'll see is we get the bike's data back from Redis as expected. So I've clicked the thing over here in the, uh, the workbook, command appears, and then we click play to run it. So let's use this approach to look at some other things. And also, if I don't dismiss this result by getting rid of it, it will stay here and we, we can store previous results and sort of build on them. So let's have a look at getting a specific set of fields. If I don't want to get the entire document, so imagine this document's quite big and I know I only want part of it, and part of the advantage of storing JSON natively in a database should be that you can have the database do some work for you. So instead of bringing back dollar, the entire document, I can also with json.get give it one or more JSON paths for fragments of the document that I want to receive. So here I'm again asking for bike ending in code 0001, but now I'm saying I want dollar.stock code, so the thing called stock code that's hanging off the root of the document, and whatever's in specs.material. So I can run this, and you'll see what we get back is a sort of smaller object that contains those JSON paths, and then the values that were found there. So this is useful for speed. If you just know that you want these fields and you don't want to pull all of that data back across the wire into your application and then have to do something with it or have the Redis client do something with it in order to parse it into a form that your programming language can understand, then keeping the amount of data that you want to retrieve down can save you a lot of time and effort. Also, 
if you're using something like a small microcontroller and your application is running in some sort of sensor or kiosk or something, this is a great way of allowing those things that have limited resources to access potentially very large documents without having to have the memory or the resources to download, parse, and store the entire document. So what we've seen there is we've also now got two results. So we've got the entire document and then compare and contrast with just getting a couple of fields from it. I'll go and remove these so that we've got a clean workspace. Now, if we want to get the same field and we want it from like multiple documents, so say we wanted something from two or more bikes, there's a way of doing that as well. So here we have this step get specific fields that we just looked at. Let's look at get a field from multiple documents. I'm going to click that and you'll see there's a difference here. Now I'm using a new command or a different command, json.mget. So rather than getting multiple paths from the same document, I'm now getting a path from multiple documents. So here I'm providing a couple of Redis keys. So the bike ending in 0001 and the one ending in two. And I'm saying I want to get the value of the brand field for both of those. So I want the brands for both of those bikes and nothing else. So when I click the button here, what we'll see is I get that result back in an array structure. Uh, the reason for that being we don't know what's at that path. So it provides it this way. And then we've saved ourselves a couple of things. We've saved ourselves a lot of parsing of JSON and we've saved ourselves running a couple of commands on the Redis server and maybe making multiple round trips to Redis by using this singular mget command and saying, I want to get this particular field for more than one document. So more than one bike. And if the field didn't exist in the other one, we just get a null back. Remember, these documents don't have to have the same structure. So even though they're all Redis bike code, colon break, they don't need to share 100% of the common structure. Some may have additional fields that others don't. And when that happens, you can expect to get null responses back for documents that don't have certain fields. So the other sort of data that we've got is a JSON array. So here we've got access elements of a JSON array. What we can see here is I can do json.get redis bytecode store ch, so the Chennai store this time. And what I'm saying here is my path is get me $.amenities, which is a JSON array, and get me the first thing in that, so it's zero indexed array. So rather than saying I want all of the amenities, I just want whichever the first one is in the array. So I can click here, and what you'll get back here is that amenity is parking. And if we do that again and just remove this, we can check that by looking at what all of the amenities are. And you'll see their parking, rentals, and repairs. So our zeroth or first amenity is in fact parking. So this is all well and good. And we've been able to access JSON documents in an efficient way and move much of the work from doing that from our application into the database where it belongs. But what if we wanted to make changes to those documents? So here in our workbook, we have a section for updating JSON documents with some example queries. So I'm gonna click here, updating an existing value. So imagine the Chennai store has moved. So we wanna do json.set, uh, the key that we wanna update. So the Chennai store, and again, the JSON path. So address was in a sub object, if you recall. So address.street. And we want to set that to Main Street. Um, let's do it. So we get the response back OK. So that tells us that happened. We can now check that that has happened correctly. So let's just do json.get redis byte co colon store colon ch. And then let's just get all of the address sub object. And what you see is the store's now on Main Street in Chennai, so our update happened as we expected. So that's great, and that's a simple sort of update. We were just replacing like for like. Let me get rid of that. We were replacing a string with another string. What if I wanted to add something that doesn't exist? So again, we're going to add something to the channel. We're going to modify the Chennai store. 
So Redis Bike Co Store Chennai, CH. We're gonna add a new thing called staff. So that means we're gonna add something at staff in the root of the JSON document. And what we're gonna add could be basically anything, but I've chosen to put an object in there. So we're gonna have staff roles and staff names. So I'm gonna say that the manager of the Chennai store becomes myself and the mechanic is Savannah off of our dev role team. So when we run this, what we'll see is again, we get okay back and let's have a look at what the object now looks like. So let's do json.get redis bike co colon store colon ch and let's get all of it this time. So what we can see now is that we have this extra staff object down the bottom. And again, to reinforce the point, we are calling these things stores and they have a sort of schema here, but Redis doesn't enforce that. So it's flexible. So we, the fact that we've added a staff object to Chennai doesn't mean that Mumbai necessarily has to have one or any of our other stores have to have one. Um, and a lot of the JSON commands work on the basis of if it's there, you'll get the value. If it isn't, you'll get a null back. So you can cope with these situations where some documents have a certain type of thing and other documents don't. So say we wanted to update our staff sub object. So we've decided that there's gonna be some changes in the staff here at Chennai. So we can do that using this command json.merge. This command basically takes a key and a path and then some more JSON and it performs a sort of patch operation on what's there already. So what we can see here is um, I'm going to give up or relinquish the management role and hand that over to Justin, who's also on our developer relations team. I am going to become the cleaner. So I am changing role from manager to cleaner. So that's a new field in the object. This is an update to an existing field. And then we are going to set our mechanic existing field. So our mechanic was Savannah. We're going to set the mechanic to null, which basically means we're not going to have a mechanic anymore. That field's not going to exist. So in this singular command, I'm able to perform a variety of different updates atomically on this document. So let's go ahead and run that. And again, you'll see we get an OK. And then what I can do is click the play button down here, save myself some typing and get the whole of the Chennai store back again. And what you'll see now is that Justin's taken over as manager. I'm the cleaner and we have no mechanic. That field is completely gone. So that's how we can basically do patch operations with json.merge. If you've worked with the JSON capability in stack before, this is actually a new command that was recently added. So let's see what else we've got here. We can retrieve the staff object to see what is going on with that. So we can just ask it, hey, who's the staff? And we get what we'd expect. And We've also not really looked at working with arrays. So here I'm going to add something to an array. So we use the json.r append command. So array append, give it a key name for the Chennai store. And we're going to add a crash into Chennai's amenities. So maybe lots and lots of customers have told us they love shopping with their kids, but they don't like having their kids with them while they're choosing a bike. So we're providing a crash to keep the kids entertained whilst the adults choose bikes. So if I run this, what you'll see is I get four back. So what's that? That's the number of things that are in the array now. So if I then run json.get dollar on the Chennai store again, run this one, you'll see that our amenities now has four things. We have parking, rentals, repairs, and crash, and it's been appended to the end there. So we can modify uh, arrays. Finally, we haven't really worked with any numeric data. So let's look at maybe we've got a sale on and we want to make a bike a little bit cheaper than it was before. So our bikes have a price field. So that's at dollar dot price. And we have a command json dot num increment by. So increment a number by. Uh, you'll notice that I'm using a negative number. So we're going to increment it by a negative number. The price is going to go down. We're having a sale. If I use a positive number, it would go up. 
And what we will get when we run that command is we get the new price of the bike back. So the price field for this key here is going to be 184,850. So what we've done there is atomically reduce the value of that number and the bike's now essentially on sale. So all of these access patterns and commands for JSON documents work great if we have the key. So if I go back to here to the browser, if we know the bike we're operating on or the store we're interested in, then that's great. But what if we want to do more searching type queries and we don't really always have access to this value? So what if we wanted to find all the mountain bikes, for example, they're not stored with that attribute, they're stored by stock code. So what we're gonna do is briefly switch back to slides and look at how the search capability of Redis stack can help us with that. Then we'll move forward, do some more searches in the workbook and look at a Python application that takes advantage of these. We want to be able to find documents that match search criteria in cases where we don't know the document's key. For example, find me all the mountain bikes in a given price range, or which of our stores have both Wi-Fi and a cafe? To do this, we'll need to define a search index that tells Redis Stack which documents to index and how to treat each field. Redis Stack will then automatically track changes in these documents for us and update the index accordingly. Having done that, we can then use the search capability to write such queries. For our bike company, we'll create two indices, one for stores and one for bikes. Here's the index for stores. What we're going to do here is use the ft.create command. What this does is it defines an index. The reason the prefix is ft is one of the capabilities of search is full text search. And we're gonna use that with our bikes, but not here in the store. So to create an index for our stores, what we need to do is basically specify which parts of the key space Redis stack should track for us and what sorts of key it should look for. So this is where having that key naming strategy comes in very handy. So here I can say ft.create, I'm going to create an index called idx colon stores, and we'll refer to that when we make some queries. And I want that thing to index JSON documents. So we say on JSON. Then I can tell it which parts of the key space in Redis I want it to find those JSON documents in. So I can provide multiple of those. I just have one prefix here, so prefix one, and then the singular prefix we want. So Redis byte co colon store colon. So all keys that begin with that, that contain a JSON object should be, or a JSON document should be indexed. Then I need to kind of go back a little bit on something that I said earlier. So while the JSON documents themselves as stored in Redis don't need to conform to a schema, in order to you know, be a store. Remember, we left the Chennai store with some staff and that object doesn't exist in all of the other ones. When we're building one of these search schemas, what we do need is all of the documents that we want to qualify should contain the fields in the schema if we want to be able to search by them. So they can contain other things or lack these fields, but we're only gonna get search results when we specify a search schema from documents that have those paths. So how we specify a schema is it's a series of JSON paths into the document. Here you can see that I'm wanting to index the store code. So that's $.store code. It's in a field called store code off the root of the document. And in my index, I want to refer to that as store code. So in queries, I can ask questions about store codes. The last thing in the line there is the word tag. That's a search index type. So what we're telling it is, I want this field to be a tag field. It's going to have a defined set of values and I want to do exact searches on them. So that's fine for store code because they are unique values. We have you know CH for Chennai, for example. Similarly, I want to index the store name, which is basically the city name in our example. So I'm using a tag for that as well. 
And then all the way down the object, I've chosen to index pretty much everything here. I could have omitted some things, but I'm indexing city, state, the pin code for the address and the country. All of those are tags because essentially I want to be able to perform full value searches on them. I'll know the value that I'm searching for. The position is slightly different. So if you recall, that was a latitude longitude value of where the store is on the globe, useful for putting it on a map or saying, which is my nearest store. The search capability supports geo searching and it has a different sort of indexing type for that. So the field type here is geo. So position there becomes geo. And then finally, what you'll see is I've also indexed the amenities array as a tag. So even though it has multiple values, we can store and query those. So I can ask that question like which store has Wi-Fi and a cafe, and it will look for two tag values in that field, Wi-Fi and cafe. So this is our command to create the index. We do this once, so we can do this as an administrative task, or we could do it as part of a data loader. That's actually what happens in this project. When you ran that data loader Python script, it created this index for us. And then once that's created, Redis stack will monitor the key space. And if documents are found in Redis bytecode colon store and their JSON type documents, it will index them automatically for us. And it will track changes in those documents, both in the structure of the document, the values there, and whether or not the document is deleted from Redis or a new document is added. So if we open a new store, we don't need to tell it, hey, re-index, it's just gonna do that for us. So that's our index for stores. We have a second one for bikes. And as you'd expect, it's pretty much a similar command. We've got some slightly different features going on here. So for our bikes, we're looking for documents of type JSON in the prefix redis bike co colon bike colon. And then our schema looks like this. So we have the stock code, the unique thing for the bike, that's a tag. And this time I've made those sortable because they have like a numeric ending to them. So we might want to sort result sets by that. I've done the same with model and brand. Again, we might want to sort, you know, find me all the mountain bikes in this price range and sort them by brand. So sortable tells the indexing service to sort these values for us or keep them in a way that's sortable. And it basically means for more performant queries. We don't have to do that at the point of retrieving the data. Uh, the type is mountain bike, kids bike, whatever. It's another tag field. And then what you'll see down the bottom there is we have a numeric field for price and also for weight. So numeric tells the indexer that this is an actual number. We might want to do range queries on that. So that's appropriate for price and weight. Then finally, that description field uses something called text. So I said to start with that F, the FT prefix is for full text commands. So fields that have the text type can be searched in a full text search way. So we don't need to have exact matches on those like we would with a tag field. Why don't we do everything as text? Because it takes up more memory to store all of the possible, uh, the possible ways of representing this field. So if we know we've got an exact match sort of thing going on, use a tag, it'll be more efficient. If we know we have sort of free text and we want to look in there for things that sound like this or that or some search term, use text. But expect text to take up a little more space in the index than a tag would. So now we've got these indices and our data loader created them for us. Redis has actually been tracking all of those documents when we loaded them. And it's time to go look at some queries. So we'll swap back to the workbench and then some Python and see how those work. So I'm back here at the workbench. And what we're going to do is look at how to query some of these documents now that we've indexed them. So remember Redis stack is indexing these in the background. Any changes we make would be reflected in the index. So there's like a continuous re-indexing process that we don't need to manage in our application. Over here in my tutorials, we have a second section called querying JSON documents. 
So I'm going to open that and we can start to look at some example queries. Now, remember the problem that we're solving with this here is sort of secondary indexing and full text search. So if we knew the stock code of a bike, we could just get that by its key, which is what we were doing with the json.get command earlier. If we knew the keys of multiple bikes that we wanted the brand for, we can do that. Um, it's not possible using that sort of approach to ask questions like which bikes are made of aluminium and weigh in the five to 10 kilogram range. For that sort of query, we need the indexing as we've seen, and we need to be able to write some search commands. So starting at the top here, we've got querying JSON documents section. I'm gonna click on this one as before, and you'll see that the command loads, and we'll take a moment to look at this before we run it. So this is the ft.search command. It's our interface for searching things that have been indexed. So we give it the name of the index we're interested in. So IDX colon bikes. You won't find that in the list of keys in Redis Insight. It's not a key as such. Um, it's just a name that we gave to the index and that's being managed for us in the background. So it doesn't appear in the, the tree list. Don't go looking for it there. Then what we need to do is give the ft.search command a search query. So that's this bit in the quotes here. And what I'm saying here is I want to look in the material field. So at material colon, and then I want an exact match because these are tags. So we use curly braces for that. And I want an exact match on aluminium. So I want the material to be aluminium. And then I have this second clause of, oh, and I want weight between five and 10 uh, weight units. So let's say kilograms. So again, I use at weight, colon for I want to look in the weight field and then because that's numeric we provide a range here so I have five and ten in the curly brace in the square braces and that means find me something that has a weight of between five and ten then once we've done that we can tell ft.search what we want to get back so part of the benefits of commands like json.get are we didn't have to pull back the whole document and incur that network penalty and the parsing penalty in the, the client and all of that stuff, if we knew what we wanted. So here I'm telling it, I want it to return four things about each matching document. I want to know the stock code, the brand, the model and the weight. So we'll get back just those bits of information from documents that match. I'm then telling it, how many results to give me. So there's a pagination methodology here. So I'm saying start with the first result, zero for one and give me three. So limit zero three there does that. And then I want them sorted by weight ascending. So I want the lightest weight one first all the way up to the, the heaviest weight one. And all of those field names are things that we put in our index. We could also put arbitrary JSON paths into the document. So you can return things that you didn't index. So you can use indexing to match and then return to get what you want. And that doesn't have to be parts of the document that were indexed. So let's just go ahead and run this. And what you'll see is Redis Insight has given us a nice table view of the results. So we get some things that we didn't ask for, but are very useful. So we got the, uh, the key names. So if we want to go work on some of these matching documents, we now know which uh, key name they live in. We got the weights and uh, as you can see the, the weights are getting bigger as they go down because we did a sort ascending stock codes, the brands and the models. Um, and we can see here that it says matched 19. So we asked for limit 03 and let us paste this query back in here again and remove that, or let's set the limit to be something a bit bigger. So let's say, let's give us the first 50. And what you should see is basically all 19 entries come back and it's tabulated them for us here in Insight. So Insight is a great tool for looking at, at developing queries. So that's a basic query, but there's also a lot of power here. It's quite simple, but 
we are looking at something here that allows us to do flexible, more SQL-like queries over something that is a key value data store. So the indexing is doing a lot of heavy lifting for us here and allows us to build more flexible applications. And then we can combine that with just retrieving the data that we want from the JSON documents. And we've got something that is both incredibly flexible and efficient. So I will remove these results and we'll look at some other queries. So what bikes, for example, do we have for kids that cost less than 10,000? So here, the sort of interesting thing is this price range here. So we said less than 10,000. We don't know what the, the lowest value is. I could have said zero, but imagine we don't know, you know, the data set doesn't tell us what the lowest possible value is. It might be a negative number for some things. So we've got minus INF, which is like the smallest number imaginable, minus infinity. Um, so we're going to find kids bikes between minus infinity and 9999. And I want to return three things from that, the brand, the model, and the price. And we're not going to specify any sorting or limiting in this case. Um, three bikes matched and, and there they are. You know, they're not in a, well, it turns out they are in price order, but we didn't specify that. So that may change. If you want an explicit order, then make the field sortable and sort by it. So that's some basic searching. If we were going to build a front end based on this data set, we want to ask some other questions like, we might want to know for building a dropdown, for example, what different types of bikes are there? So get me all possible values of a certain field. And there's a second command ft.aggregate that helps us do that. So here I'm saying ft.aggregate on the bikes index. So for the bikes, star basically means match everything. So I consider all of the documents. And then I want the results grouped by one field and that field is type. So again, this is a sort of like SQL group by, we're saying aggregate all of the data, get me the distinct values of type. And when I run that, what you can see is we have seven different types of bike and they are enduro bikes, kids bikes, road bikes, and so on. We could now use this information to build a data-driven front end that says, oh, what sort of bike do you want? And then use this to allow people to choose a facet in a further search. So, you know, pick commuter bikes and then add a price range and build up a query like that. So that's a basic intro to the aggregation command. Um, it can also perform counts and sums and, and so forth. So let's clear that. And what if we don't want all of our clauses to be anded together? So Sometimes we want to use an OR operator. Everything we've looked at so far ands the clause together, clauses together. So here I'm querying for, I want road bikes that are made of either carbon or which are full carbon. So the entire thing's carbon as opposed to just the frame, you know, the fork, the seat post, everything might be carbon. So here I'm saying I want the type field to equal road bikes. And I want the material field to be carbon pipe for ore and then full carbon. And I've escaped that uh, dash in full carbon. So it doesn't confuse it with minus, which is a sort of negation operator. So what we're saying here is I want all the road bikes that are carbon or full carbon. And again, we come back, we get seven, it's returned the first seven. It's going to return 10 by default for all search queries, unless we use limit to say we want more or less than that. And then if we get more than that and we want to paginate through them, we just alter the values to limit to efficiently paginate through the results set. So that's how we do carbon or full carbon. Let's have a look at something a little bit different. So clear this result set out. So we want to find bikes that are comfortable. Now, that's mostly in the description field. We don't have a tag for comfortable. We have this text field that describes the bike and its description and its free text. So we index that as text. So we're going to find words that are comfortable or like comfortable. 
And then what we want to say is, and are not made of aluminium or alloy. So here we have a clause for aluminium pipe alloy. Here we have the field we're looking in, material, and here we have the minus the negation operation. And we put those two clauses next to each other and they're anded together. So it's comfortable and not these two materials. So I'll run that. And what happens now is we get these two bikes that come back and we can hover over this and look at what's in there. Um, so here it says that gives great comfort and handling. That's how it's sort of full text matched on comfortable. And in here, um, this one says the same thing. So the word comfortable wasn't in there, but full text matching has got something for us. So here we're finding the comfortable ones and not aluminium or alloy. The other thing to note here is I'm not specifying what to return. So I get a return of dollar, which is the entire document, which might be what I want. If I don't want that, I could just add a return clause and start to limit things down. So what happens if we decide to change our data model a little bit? So we might want to index some new things. So taking a look at this command here, I'm going to add a new field to some of the bikes. So we are going to store a numeric field called thumbs up. We're going to use dollar dot thumbs up. So a sub key called thumbs up in the root of the JSON document. And I'm going to store that value for several bikes in one go. So I'm using json.m set here, multiple set, and I'm going to give it to bike 13, bike 34, and bike 99. They're all going to get different values of this thumbs up attribute. So off we go. That's okay. That's happened. Those bikes have now got thumbs up. So what we need to do in order to use that in an index, so that value still exists. We can pull it back in existing queries about other things, but we can't write queries that involve the thumbs up yet. So what I need to do is I'll go ahead here and click amend bikes index. And what we're going to do is run the ft.alter command that changes an existing search index. We're altering the idx bikes index. And I'm saying I want to add to the schema. I want to add the path dollar dot thumbs up in the JSON document, call it thumbs up in my schema and have it numeric and sortable. So if I do that, we get okay back. And what happens is the index gets rebuilt to include this additional field. So we should now just be able to query it. So if I say I want all of the bikes that have a thumbs up value between zero and plus infinity. So who knows, whatever the most thumbs up you could possibly have is. And I want to know the following three things about them. I want the brand, the model, and the thumbs up. And I want them sorted by that thumbs up value descending. So I can now run this query. I get a nice table back. And here are those, it's just the three bikes that I added to that have that. But again, remember that the other bikes don't need to have that just because we didn't put it in there. It doesn't break any sort of schema, even though it's in the search schema. Documents that don't conform to that just don't count for this query. So the ones we get back are the ones that have it. So let's scroll down a little bit and see some other fun types of query um, about our stores. I'll clear this one off. So we might want to, when we're choosing a store, rent a bike and we might want to take our own car there. So we need to know which store provides parking and rentals. And if you remember the, in the stores data model, the amenities in the JSON documents were an array of strings. So an array of fixed values of strings. So parking's one and rentals another, and we index those as a tag. So we can say, I want the stores that have these things. And when we do that, what we get back is these two stores, Chennai and Kochi. And if we hover over there, you can see that the amenities for this store include both of the things we asked for, parking and rentals. And the amenities for this store also include parking and rentals. And oh, there's that new value crash that we provided earlier and that new object with the staff in it. So again, the documents do not have to conform to the exact same schema, even though we now have a search schema. It's just for the bits that we want to search over. 
And the other thing that we might want to know when we're looking for a store is, well, which is my closest store to where I am or, or where somebody that I'm maybe buying a bike for is? And we indexed the position field, which was a long lat with a comma in between them in our data. We index that as geo, and that means we can now ask through the search command questions of that. So we can say for this type of field, we give it the field name position, we give it a position we're interested in. So this is a specific place in India that's not one of our stores. And we say, well, what's within a hundred kilometers of that? And then again, I can say what I want to get back and I could put limit clause on this or sort clause or all of those things. So I want to get the store code and the city. So within this position, um, the camper store is the one that's within a hundred Ks of that. If we copy this and paste it and maybe set that to a thousand K, let's see if we get anything bigger. Nope. We still get that one store. So let's do it again and come up with a really big number. So let's try what's within 7,000 kilometers of that. Cause the stores are all around the country. And what you'll find is the majority of our stores now fall into that result set. So we can do geo based stuff and we can plot this on a map. So these are examples of queries that we can perform. Uh, we did them all in the workbench here. In a real world, you're going to do these in an application. So what we're going to do now is swap over to look at some Python and see how to call these using the Redis Py client for Redis from the context of a Flask application written in Python. I'm back here at the terminal and what we can see is the output of that data loader that we ran some time ago to initially load all of the data into Redis. Let's take a look at the code for that and briefly see how we could have created those indices from Python. So moving to VS Code here, I have our project from GitHub and in the root of the project, there's this file called dataloader.py. And what this does is it loads all of the data from the data files into Redis as JSON documents. And it also goes ahead and creates those indices for us. Doing this in code may or may not be the right thing for your application and your problem space. It depends. You can have this as an administrative task that somebody performs at the command line, or you can run it in the code if you're doing a sort of code driven deployment. I've chosen to put it in the code just so that we can see how those commands that we looked at on the slides earlier translate to Python. So here I'm using the Redis Py Python client for Redis. So that's a sort of SDK for interacting with Redis from the Python language. I've imported it there just as import Redis. And then we have some preamble for cleaning things up. But what I wanted to look at in this case really quickly was how we go ahead and create those search indexes. So I have a constant for bike index name, which is IDX bikes. And we are going to call ft.create index. So a little bit like the command in Redis was in the workbench was ft.create. And then we pass in a list here of all the field types and how we want to index them. So we've got some tags here and the JSON paths through to the document and as name is what we want those fields to be known as in the index and whether or not we want them to be sortable. So we do that for each field. And then we provide in an additional uh, definition parameter down here, what type of key we're looking to index. So JSON documents and also which prefixes, and we can have more than one uh, key prefixes, do we want to index? So we're saying JSON documents, whose keys begin with this byte key base constant, which is Redis byte co, colon bytes colon. So this is how we do it in code, or we could do it in the uh, workbench or the command line as we saw before. But either way, you need to create indices before you go ahead and uh, write search queries. You can create these indices before or after you've loaded the documents. This data loader happens to create both of them just before it then goes into a loop here and loads all of the documents. And again, you'll see that commands for storing things in Redis look remarkably like the Redis commands we looked at in the workbench. So we use json.set to update a document. 
we provide it with the key, we provide it with a JSON path, so dollar here, the root of the document. And then bike here is a, um, a Python dictionary that contains all of the values, and that will persist that into Redis. That's how the data loader works. Um, if you're interested in that, I'd suggest spending more time looking at the code, but it's not core to understanding this workshop. So let's move along and see how we can write some of those queries in a Flask application. So let's take a look at the Flask application that is part of this workshop. It's contained in a single file because it's an extremely simple application with no front end. We're just going to demonstrate by showing JSON in the browser. So all of our code is in app.py and we'll come back to look at what that does in a moment. But let's go ahead, start the application and see some queries in action. So from the terminal here, I can run poetry run flask run. And that should start up the application. It will start up a flask server and it listens on port 5000. So I'm going to copy that and then I'm going to switch to my browser. And we'll paste that in there. And what we can see is make that a little bit larger. What we can see is we've got a really basic home page for this application and we've got some queries that we can run. So if we run find stores near a location, we've got a route here, API stores nearby. This is a location, latitude, longitude, 10,000 kilometers. And then we're going to ask it a more complicated question than just that. We want stores that have Wi-Fi and do rentals as well. And then what we can see here is we've got some output from the application that is all the results are going to be in a data array. And each object is going to be something that came back from Redis that the search capability of Redis stack identified as matching our criteria. So all of these stores have uh, Wi-Fi and rentals, and they're all within 10,000 kilometers of, of our location there. So how does that work? Let's go quickly look at the code. So similarly to our data loader, I'm using Redis Pi. So I've just imported Redis there. Um, I've imported some other helpers here that are going to allow us to build search queries nicely. And we've got some preamble that connects to Redis. There's a configurable environment file that you shouldn't need to change if you're working with a Docker um, solution. Just go check the readme for how to set that up. We start a Flask application and we'll not get into how Flask applications work, but basically we can decorate functions with API route paths. And then when we hit those in a browser, we can determine what data to serve. And that's how we're working with Redis here. So here is a function that responds to the route we just looked at. So stores nearby are given latitude and longitude. Basically, what Flask does for us is calls this function for us and parses out the parameters into the parameters the function expects. And what we are then doing is building up a query in Redis. So we're building up that um, amenities list in the at amenities that you saw me using in the workbench. And we are then going to put that into this Redis command here. So Redis client is Redis Pi in this case, .ft.search. So similar to the uh, ft.search that you saw me running in the workbench. We give it an index name to search over, so the stores. And then we give it a query, which is basically a formatted string of the Redis query that we want to run. So the ultimate query looks a bit like this one up here. And I've done this with all of these code samples. They've all got the underlying actual query that you can just paste into the the workbench if you want to try it there. And that's what it looks like. So it says, give me all the stores that are within. Um, in this case, I've used 100 as an example. The, the front end uses a wider number to get more results and have Wi-Fi and a cafe. Then what we get back is basically a list or an array of doc objects. And what we do from there is each doc object has got a JSON field for whatever JSON came back from the query. We convert that so that we can build a Python dictionary out of it. And we just send that dictionary back and Flask understands how to turn that into JSON. So none of that is Redis specific, that's sort of Flask stuff. 
But basically, our queries from the workbench translate to this ft.search command. And if you've built up a query in the workbench and you're comfortable with it, it's relatively simple to move it into Python here and start to parameterize it so you can feed values in. The other routes work similarly. So I'll go back to my homepage here. And you see, we've got find distinct values for a tag. We'll look at this one because it uses um, a different command. It doesn't use that search command. If you remember, I was using the aggregate command for this because I want to find like one instance or unique instances of all values of, of this particular tag. So we've gone for brand here. We've got several different brands. And let's have a look at the route for that. So down here, the ultimate command it's going to run is similar to the one that you saw in the workbench section before, where I did it for, I think, bicycle types. But now we're going to provide a tag field through the parameters. So I've provided brand, and that's what that value becomes in the ATTR variable here. And now I'm running something remarkably similar again to what we ran in the workbench. So ft bike index name dot aggregate. And then I'm sending in instead of a query, it's an aggregate request. And that understands things like a group by clause. So we're saying query everything, group by values of whatever the, um, the tag name that was passed in. And again, similar, a little bit of data massage on what comes back to get, in this case, a Python list, which comes back as a JSON array. So we have a few other queries that you can run in your own time. So get all the store details for a given store, get some details about a bike, given a stock code. Let's quickly look at that one because that shows how to run just one of the underlying JSON commands. So if we didn't need to search something, we know what the stock code is. We can just run the json.get command using this as part of the Redis key. So if we scroll down to that one here, so if get the brand model and price for a bike given a stock code, what you'll see is that stock code gets passed in here. And then I could search for it because we have it indexed, but because I know the stock code and I know my data is stored by stock code in part of the key, I'm just going to do a json.get and build up the key name for it and then ask it for three JSON paths. And then I'll get those back and turn that into a dictionary that again can be sent out back to the front end. And that's what you see here. So I picked on that one because that one uses a different underlying command. These other two, I'll let you explore in your own time because they're just variations on the same thing. So that's how we do queries in a simple Python application. I would encourage you to play around with this yourself and write your own. In this segment, we saw how to store, manage, index, and query JSON documents in Redis, both from the workbench in Redis Insight and the Python application. I hope you choose to try this out for yourself. Here's our GitHub repository, which contains all of the data, code, and instructions that you need. If you need help or you have questions, find me on Discord in the Redis Days India workshop channel. Sign up at discord.gg slash redis. I'll now hand over to Brian, who will demonstrate how to add vector similarity search capabilities to our bike company case study. Thanks for watching. Hello, and welcome back to the second part of the session. I am Brian Samboden. Hopefully you had a great time learning from Simon. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about similarity search with Redis and using Redis as a vector database. Before we get started, uh, let me load the data that Simon created for us. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to load the data for the bicycles collection and that's going to be uh, loaded into Redis as JSON documents and we're going to be working with that today. So let me take a quick look here uh, in Redis inside and I'm going to check that the data is all there. So we click one of our bicycles, we can see that we have a JSON document stored uh, for each one of the bicycles. Perfect. So now let me switch back to our slides and start the show. All right, so I am Brian Samboden, 
And today we're going to start by talking about the unstructured data problem. And that is the exponential explosion in recent years of the amount of um, unstructured data that we have in at our disposal and how to uh, take advantage of that data. So that this, this data balance have changed radically in the, in the last uh, 15 to 20 years. And it is estimated that 80% of the data right now, it's unstructured. And the percentage is supposed to keep on growing over the years. So what is unstructured data? Uh, it's data that does not fit in a relational database, that can be broken into rows and columns, that it's hard to uh, index and work with with a traditional search engine. Uh, and it's also high dimensional data. Imagine uh, a long text passage. It might contain a lot of information about, let's say, a product review. It might have a sentiment information about how the person feels about the product. It might have, it might have information about the functioning and quality of the product. So there's a lot of different angles that we can extract information from semantically rich high dimensional data. And examples of data like this include images. An image could be a scene with a lot of different information that we want to take advantage of. Uh, it could be videos, or uh, free form text, and audio. So here is this uh, inverted pyramid that kind of represents the hierarchy of, of uh, structure in data. So we have structured data at the bottom uh, where you have something well-defined with a schema that fits very well into a normalized uh, relational database. Then you have semi-structured data like JSON, XML, uh, spreadsheets. Uh, you can consider most of Redis uh, data structures to, to be a semi-structured uh, data store. And uh, then you have quasi-structure where you have things with erratic patterns and formats. Imagine clickstream data. And finally, you have unstructured data where it's a free-for-all. You have very high uh, dimensional uh, information. And it could be anything from uh, documents, PDF, images, video, audio. So how do we deal with this unstructured data? Uh, the unstructured data typically uh, in, in the past, uh, or it still has to be transformed to be worked with. Uh, so you have to transform the data from uh, unstructured to structure or semi-structure. Uh, in, in the process, you typically have to drop dimensions. You have to drop, uh, reduce the dimensionality of your data. In, uh, in the engineering process of doing that, it's called uh, feature extraction. So for example, if you're dealing with, uh, let's say, a sunglass company, uh, a sunglasses company or a glasses company, where things like eye shape, eyebrow shape, uh, eye color, uh, and the position of the eyes relative to each other, it's important, then you want to extract those features from pictures, uh, but completely ignore other things like, for example, um, I don't know, the neckline or the shoulders or something like that. So uh, features are things that we are interested in that we want to extract from our, from our unstructured data. So the, the traditional uh, extraction techniques include uh, labeling. So for example, uh, you would have uh, human uh, uh, taggers that will basically look at a picture and uh, either create bounding boxes for specific things and then labels. Uh, in a scene, for example, I could say somebody that would say, oh, here, this is a dog. Basically, the exercise that Google has uh, had us do for the last 20 years, basically, to prove that we are not robots. Uh, we were proving that we were not robots by, by training the robots. So labeling and tagging, uh, classification and folksonomy, or, or taxonomies and folksonomies are pretty common traditional techniques for dealing with unstructured data. Uh, other techniques include to uh, one hot encoding with, for example, you would basically find features uh, and the feature would be either on or off and you create a, a bit array uh, with the uh, features that are on as ones and the feature that are not present in that specific piece of data as zeros. But the, the common thing in here is that when we extract features, we typically encode them as vectors. And um, here's an example of manual image feature extraction. Imagine that we have a bicycle uh, and a, a human uh, tagger or, uh, or processor would basically uh, look for features of interest to the business. In, in this example, there would be something like the frame collar, the tire collar, uh, whether it has a rear rack, uh, whether it has fenders over the tires, uh, whether it has a safety bell, uh, and whether it has fat tires or not. That seems to be a trend nowadays. 
And you can see that the value, uh, it's in some specific value space determined by um, the, the company's purpose. Uh, the same thing can be done with something like text. You know, you could have a, a humans read uh, support reviews and then uh, give a star rating, let's say from a zero to five or from a zero to one as a, as a kind of float value, uh, things that we can discern from those product reviews. In this case would be how easy is a bicycle to be assembled, the quality of the chain, the seat comfort, the smoothness of the gear uh, changing, things of that sort. Um, so when we do all this, we end up with vectors, uh, either, uh, they're vectors that are suitable for human consumption, like the one hot encoding, uh, or it could be vectors that are uh, designed to basically work with a machine. And the idea is that vectors basically, um, brings us into the word of, uh, into the world of linear algebra. And with linear algebra and vectors, we can do comparisons. We compare the vectors in terms of their uh, direction, their length, and, and their position in, in a space of features that we're trying to map. So uh, a vector, again, it's just a simple numeric representation of something in this n-dimensional space, uh, with the n uh, being the number of features typically that you're trying to extract from something. Uh, a, a vector can represent anything. It could be a, a document, it could be a, a PDF, a Word document, uh, an entire uh, uh, you know, news magazine edition, uh, a video, a segment of a video, uh, a full song, or an audio clip. And the vectors quantify those features that we actually are trying to extract from the data. Uh, but again, the most important thing is that, and what is relevant to us, is that vectors are comparable. So in, uh, in, in a vector, you have an array, basically. And inside of that array, you have values. And those uh, we call uh, scalars. And the, the, the scalar, it's a measure of the feature. Uh, typically, for machine learning vectors, those values are uh, between uh, 0 and 1. Uh, in, in the data structure that we use to hold a vector has a lot of different names depending on the framework you're using. In Python, you would have, in NumPy would be the, the, the common NumPy array. Uh, and in TensorFlow and PyTorch, you have a, a tensor class. So when you hear the word tensor, uh, think of a word array. And when you hear the word array, think of a, the word a vector. They are all vectors. So here's an example of a visualization of that green bicycle that we had before uh, with some of the uh, start ratings for the uh, features of easy assembly, chain quality, uh, sit comfort, and uh, gear smoothness. And we have, uh, you can see by the bicycle image, we have a representation of a vector as the values four, three, and one. So basically an array. And in this three-dimensional space, which is kind of all that we can uh, visualize, uh, being uh, beings that live in 3D. Uh, we have three axes in here, so we pick three features to basically map the vector. But in reality, the vectors would be on n-dimensional space, and, uh, and it would be much harder to, uh, well, impossible for us to visualize them unless we do some kind of um, dimensionality reduction to visualize. And we'll do some of that later. So um, obviously, there are features with doing this manual feature engineering. Um, there for, for many years, there were companies completely dedicated to uh, uh, employing an army of folks to basically tag and classify uh, images, documents, um, you know, you name it. Uh, there, was, there was a team uh, out there somewhere in, in a uh, data center basically working uh, day and night to, to tag information uh, on our behalf. But of course, this is time consuming and it requires domain knowledge. So depending on what you're doing, you might uh, require an expert to be able to discern specific features from the data. Uh, the data can be very high dimensional. So uh, even if you have a trained expert working at the data, there are things that you are going to miss. There are subtle semantic clues in the data that you are going to miss. And it's also not scalable. For a process like that, you would need, um, the more data you have, the more people you would need. So of course, you know, we have tried to basically automate the process and, and two things happen. In, uh, in the last you know, 10 to 15 years, machine learning and deep learning have skyrocketed. Um, 
I've been uh, aware of the field for, for a long time and kind of working on the periphery of it. And I was uh, very focused on uh, a computer vision. And the, the model for computer vision basically jumped exponentially at one, at one point in the last 10 years. So computer vision models now are uh, much more accurate than humans at detection and classification tasks. Uh, so, so most of these models outperform humans and can do things in uh, a fraction of a of, of millisecond, uh, while a human might take, you know, minutes or hours. And of course, recently we are all aware of the the big news with with LLMs or um, uh, large language models. So basically, out of the field of um, of text classification in, uh, in natural language processing, these large language models have emerged that can also uh, do amazing things with unstructured data. Um, in, in, in the case uh, of uh, LLMs, it would be basically prompts in, in long collections of text. But the thing that the computer vision models in, in large language models have in common is that at some point, they turn the data into a vector that it's flatter than the original data. So they basically take something that by, might be multidimensional uh, and they still keep in uh, dimensions, but they give us the data in a flat form that makes it very suitable to uh, be worked with as vectors. So uh, when we use a machine learning model to generate vectors from unstructured data, we call those vector embeddings. And uh, the, the, this machine learning models can extract uh, contextual information out of the data uh, with, uh, we, without us even knowing basically what the vector um, contains in it in terms of uh, being a human consumable. So for example, uh, you can get uh, out of a computer vision model, like let's say YOLO 5, uh, you could get a vector for a specific image that would basically classify the image uh, as a specific object, um, but you necessarily won't be able to uh, do anything, any reasoning with the vector by itself. But what you can do with vectors is compare them to other vectors or you can group them together. So you can have um, collections of vectors that are near each other are semantically similar. So uh, things that are related are closer to each other. So again, uh, the machine learning models will reduce the semantically rich, super high dimensional uh, data into a flat vector that we can use in our uh, vector search engines in vector databases. So in the, uh, this is an, an illustration of a typical um, computer vision model. And as you can see, you end up with uh, images and then you, you start with images and then you apply convolutions and pooling uh, layers and more convolution layers. And then eventually you flatten those layers and end up with hidden, uh, fully connected uh, layers. And those layers are the ones that we typically uh, grab to use as vectors. So at the end of one of these machine learning uh, pipelines, you end up, in this case, it's two outputs, you can see to the, to the right of the uh, image. Those two outputs will be, uh, the, imagine this is a binary classification uh, model. I might tell you uh, whether it's a cat or a dog. And uh, rather than grabbing that classification, we don't use that result. Instead, we use the uh, embedded flat vectors before we get to the classification uh, answer. So let's talk about vector databases. So what is a vector database? In a, a pure vector database, uh, it's a system that's supposed to store only vectors uh, efficiently. You should be able to store them and recreate them efficiently. Uh, there should be some metadata about the, uh, the vectors to be able to do um, more uh, problem space reduction. Uh, and also you should be able to search uh, that vector space using similarity metrics and distance metrics. And this is again all from linear algebra. So um, it's uh, well-known algorithms and procedures to basically determine uh, whether two vectors are similar to each other and get a measure of that. And also find out how far away a vector is from another vector. 
Uh, and then the, uh, the, the hybrid searches uh, become a super powerful uh, feature when you want to be able to search the vector space, but also use the metadata space to filter those vector search results and to make it more uh, performant. Okay, so let's talk about Redis as a vector database. Why is Redis a good choice as a vector database? First of all, uh, Redis is uh, fast by nature. Uh, it uh, has an in-memory first approach, which basically makes all of these CPU uh, bound operations very fast. Um, Redis provides many, many different uh, semi-structured data uh, uh, structures that we can basically work with. Uh, and they can serve as our metadata, but we also have uh, search capabilities on top of that. So uh, nowadays, uh, Redis can support uh, indexing and searching of text, numeric, uh, tags, uh, geo fields, and geo shape fields. And um, in the last uh, few years, we have introduced the vector schema type. So now uh, Redis, it's a bona fide vector database. So uh, Redis search capabilities allow you to index and query vectors in, uh, that are stored either in Redis hashes or Redis JSON. And again, being an in-memory database or in-memory first database allows Redis to be a, a, incredibly fast and efficient uh, when performing vector searches. So uh, let's talk about Redis as a vector database. Uh, the capabilities are uh, Redis provides three distance metrics. So there's three different ways to basically calculate the distance between vectors. Uh, Euclidean, which is basically, you know, uh, uh, draw a two ninety, uh, do a, a 90 degree line between two, uh, two vectors, uh, the internal product or the cosine, uh, cosine being the most efficient of this two in here. But between internal product and cosine, it really depends how the data was vectorized uh, to, to, the, to decide which one to use. We also have two indexing methods. We have uh, HNSW and flat. Uh, flat, it's basically brute force, which means that the whole uh, vector space would always be search. Uh, but it's it's efficient. It's ac very accurate. Uh, HNSW, it's uh, um, and, uh, it's uh, a technique that allows you to basically reduce that space of vectors to uh, to optimize the search process, but at the at the penalty of some accuracy. And, but in most cases, with very high dimensional data, the results between the two are, to, in my mind, almost, uh, it's very hard to tell them apart. So uh, Redis also supports hybrid queries, uh, basically combining the geo, tax, text, or numeric uh, search fields with your vector fields. All right, so in our demo, we're going to add similarity search to the bikes uh, company data set that um, Simon loaded for us. So uh, for the demo, first we need to connect to Redis and we're gonna use the Redis Pi client library. And first we have to create a client connection. So our client connection uh, here, as you can see, imports uh, Redis. Uh, and then creates a client instance by calling the Redis uh, function, passing the local host in the typical Redis port 6379. And we're actually deciding to decode the, res the responses. Uh, Redis uh, responses are binary, and in our case, we're going to basically decode them uh, to text. So we uh, run that, and now we can use the uh, ping command. So we're gonna use the ping command to basically make sure that Redis is up and running. So let's go ahead and ping the server, and you can see that we get a true response from the server. And actually, let me switch to Redis Insight for a second in here, and let's turn the profiler on for a quick second in here, and then let's uh, run our ping command again, and you should be able to see it now live running in Redis. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, leave that running. That's uh, not a problem. And now let's continue with the slides. All right, so we have Redis uh, up and running. We have a client instance that we can use to talk to Redis. Now uh, you probably learn a lot about uh, JSON as a data type in Redis from Simon. And I am going to just recap just a little bit of it. 
So in here, first, I'm going to test that I can get uh, to one of the bicycle uh, JSON documents. So in this case, I'm retrieving the bike 67, which has the a key shown in red in this on the screen. And then uh, by putting the bike uh, below the declaration, I should be able to see its con contents. So uh, here is our bike. You can see how fast things come back from Redis. So we have the uh, stock code. It uh, matches what we have in our ID. We have the model Mars, the brand bicycle, uh, and the price 17350. Uh, and notice that uh, down below, there's a big chunk of text, which is a description of the bike. So that's what we're going to target today. We're going to try to create embeddings from that description. So then we can basically do searches uh, across the universe of bikes that we have in the data set. So again, to generate good embeddings, you have to start with the right model. So first of all, you have to discern what your uh, problem is. Uh, and you might use one or, or more models to basically create embeddings uh, that can be used in your system. Uh, embeddings sometimes can be combined. Uh, there's different techniques to combine the embeddings. Uh, sometimes uh, being, the, uh, being just a, a long array of numbers, uh, basically concatenating two embeddings, it's sometimes perfectly fine. So in here, notice that we have if the music uh, if it's a music problem, we have an we would have an audio model for this. If it's a specific, let's say pop songs, there might be models trained on pop songs, um, pre-trained models that can basically serve your specific purpose. So not always do you have to train your own mo own models. Nowadays, there's a plethora of pre-trained models in what we call model zoos. So different. Uh, um, Institutions like Hogging Phase uh, would have aggregations of models uh, from companies and from open source that you can use uh, for your purposes. So again, pick the right model for your embeddings, uh, whether it's audio, video, a vision model, there's a specific face detection, face recognition models. There are models trained on human body poses. Uh, there's models trained on extracting sentiment out of text. Uh, so you can extract your uh, your embeddings from your structured data, turn them into vectors, and then store the, those vectors in a powerful database that has vector capabilities like Redis. Uh, and I was talking about the uh, the model zoos. So there's a, a few examples in here. You have the uh, TensorFlow Hub. You have Hogging Face, which is one of the most popular, and then you have the PyTorch uh, Hub. So today we're going to use uh, a framework called Sentence Transformers. And Sentence Transformers are, as the name implies, are embeddings trained specifically to turn um, sentences, uh, mostly in, uh, in English, uh, the, the, but there's support for a lot of different languages, but most of the models are uh, really extensively trained in, in, on English. Uh, to generate embeddings for bike descriptions. In the, uh, the, the bird models, uh, it's what you'll find in sentence bird. They basically produce uh, very context rich uh, embeddings for your data. In the, the, uh, in, when we talk about a sentence, uh, the sentence can be of any length and it could be what we will consider multiple sentence, sentences together. So a whole uh, book could be treated as a sentence by one of these models and an embedding could be generated. Obviously, the, the longer the text, uh, the difference between the text length and the length of our embeddings, uh, you will lose some um, resolution, if, if, if you will, uh, the longer the text you use. So typically, you will find a, a sweet spot of the length of the text that you want to generate embeddings, embeddings for and the length of the embeddings that you can efficiently process with your uh, database. And these embeddings generated by the uh, sentence bird models are um, very well suited for semantic search and text grouping. So again, we're going to select a suitable pre-trained model. Um, for our case, we want to use short query prompts to find bicycles uh, against the longer bicycle descriptions. So in, in, the, um, in the machine learning world or the uh, NLP world, this is called an asymmetric semantic search. Uh, meaning that the two sides of the searching process are not the same. So we have short queries and long descriptions. 
So for that, we need to find a specific model that works for our purposes. And uh, the MS Marco models, the Microsoft Marco models, are optimized for uh, that type of real-world query uh, using shorter prompts and longer uh, descriptions. So uh, I picked the highest performing MS Marco model to date, which is the uh, name after the identifier, MS Marco Distilled Bird Base V4, and it is fine-tuned for cosine similarity. So we will use cosine similarity in our search indices because our embeddings are fine-tuned for cosine similarity. So the first thing I'm gonna do is import the sentence transformers uh, function, and then I'm going to load the embedder, which is basically going to encapsulate the sentence transformer uh, MS Marco model. So uh, that is running right now. And it just takes a, a few seconds to load. So it's loaded right now. And now uh, let's actually test it. So I'm going to extract uh, one of the descriptions of a bike into a variable called sample description. So you can see here that I have a sample description and I am going to uh, take that bicycle that we've retrieved before, the bike 67, and I'm just going to grab the description field and put it in sample description. So there is our description. And uh, you can see that this sounds like a good kid's bicycle. And uh, now we're gonna generate the embeddings by using the encode function that uh, we get from the embedder. So here is the uh, embedding variable that's going to contain the result of encoding the sample description. And then we're gonna check the dimension of that embedding so we know uh, the size, the dimension of our index field for the embedding. So let's run that, and you can see that we uh, at the embedding process, it's incredibly fast. Uh, and now we have a vector of 768 elements. So 768 scalars in our vector. Now let's take a peek at the first five elements of the vector. So I'm going to print, uh, I'm going to turn that into a list and grab the first five elements. And you can see here that they are uh, float numbers. Uh, between uh, minus one and plus one. So depending on, on the uh, system and the models, you're gonna find uh, values from zero to one or from minus one to one. So now that we know how to grab a description of a bicycle and then use the embedder to generate a vector embedding, let's do that to all the bicycles in the database. So the first thing I'm gonna do is collect all the keys from the bicycles. So I'm going to use my uh, Redis client and I'm gonna invoke the keys command passing the prefix of our bicycle keys, uh, which is the Redis bike co column bike column uh, prefix. And I'm gonna sort that and put it into the variable keys. And then I'm gonna check what the length of the keys retrieved uh, were. So you can see here that we have 111 bicycles and let's just print uh, the first three keys to basically see what the contents look like. So you can see here that we have uh, the key one, two, and three. Of course, we sorted the list so we get them order. So now we're going to generate embeddings for the bike's descriptions. So now that we have the keys, we're gonna use the Redis JSON uh, mget, which is a multiple get, to basically pass all the keys, retrieve all the descriptions in one shot, but only the description, not any other parts of the objects. We're gonna store the descriptions in a descriptions array or list, and then we're going to code the encode uh, in the encode method from the encoder in bulk mode to basically uh, deal with this. So first we're gonna import NumPy. We're gonna use NumPy uh, here to basically turn the encoding as a NumPy float32 uh, value before we put them in the final list. So notice in here that the uh, first line here, the descriptions, I'm grabbing the uh, Redis client and using the mget JSON command, passing the keys that I collected already, and then I'm using a JSON path um, expression to retrieve only the description text. Then for each one of those descriptions, I'm going to flatten that uh, into a single list. And finally, because this is uh, what we get from the client, the mget is going to be a list of lists. 
So the second line right here, it's flattening the list into a single list. And then finally, the encode method can be overloaded by passing a list of targets rather than just a single uh, text description. So I'm going to pass all the descriptions, turn them into NumPy float32s, and turn that into a list. So let's go ahead and run this. And you can see that we have um, basically two Mississippis before it was done. <laughs> Uh, two seconds before it was done. And now let's uh, check that we generated the right number of uh, embedding vectors. I believe the number of keys that we had was 111. So let's check the length of the embeddings. And voila, we have 111 uh, embeddings now. So once uh, we have, now we have all of our embeddings, uh, we need to put them back in the database. Remember, our JSON documents did not have an embedding for the description. So what we're going to do now is going to use the JSON set command to insert a new field into each one of the documents by their uh, key. And we're going to uh, put that in the description embeddings field. And we're going to do this in what we call Redis pipeline mode, uh, which you can think of it as a transaction. Uh, it's really basically opens a pipeline of commands. All the commands are sent to Redis and then processed in a, in a single shot uh, rather than having to have round trips uh, on the network. So, so to do this, I'm going to create a pipeline in, from the client. So I create a pipeline. Then in this uh, loop, I'm going to basically be uh, pairing the keys with the embeddings. And uh, so remember, I, I sorted the keys and the embeddings were created based on the sorted of, sorting of the keys. So these two lists uh, are basically parallel elements. So then I'm going to use the, the pipeline. Rather than using the client directly, I use the pipeline uh, JSON function. And I'm going to call set on, on that, passing the specific key and the embedding. And uh, the set command basically takes the key target of the document uh, a JSON path expression in the value. And then I call pipeline execute, which will basically uh, tell the server to, hey, take this whole set of commands and run them server side. So let's go ahead and run this. And you can see how fast uh, Redis is that uh, we basically just stored uh, 111 uh, embeddings in probably uh, less than a millisecond. All right, so now let's inspect the bytes document to make sure that our vector embeddings ended up in the right place. So to do that, again, we're going to use the uh, JSON get command. Uh, we're going to just grab the first key, and I'm going to do a little bit of a pretty printing here to the JSON by adding an indent of two using the JSON dumps uh, command. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, run this. And you can see now that we have our, our original data. We have our stock model, model brand, price type, uh, the specs uh, object, our description. And then below description, we have the description embeddings. And you can see that obviously this is a lot of data that it's not meant for human consumption, but we should have 768 uh, floats in that JSON array. All right, so we have our embeddings in place, and we can also go to Redis Insight and pick any of our bikes. Uh, let me go ahead and pause the profiler. Let me close this window and close the CLI. And you can see now that if I pick any of our bikes below, we have uh, the description embeddings. And if you expand that, you can see a view of the 768 elements should be. So let's let's double check that. So 767 um, starting at zero. So 768 total elements. Perfect. So let's go back to the, uh, to the code or the code slash slides. So now we can, so we have our description embeddings in the database. Now we're going to create a index to be able to search over the semi-structured data that we have in our JSON documents and also the unstructured data that we have in the embeddings. So we're going to define uh, a few imports uh, from the Redis Py client. We're going to use the index definition and the index type. Uh, the index definition is basically a builder for the index. The index type will give us the type of index we want to create either against uh, JSON documents or hashes. In our case, it's going to be JSON. We're going to define uh, several schema fields 
to determine which fields from the JSON we want to search over. So we're going to have tag fields, text fields, uh, numeric fields, and vector fields in there. And we're going to name our index uh, IDX for index, column bytes VSS, uh, bytes for the collection of bytes, and VSS for vector similarity search. All right, so in here, we basically deal with the imports and um, creating a couple of constants for the index name and the prefix that we're going to use to find the documents to index. So uh, I'm going to run that. I ran that. Now uh, we're going to create the index search schema. And this is going to be probably the longest chunk of code that you need to uh, worry about here. Um, but again, it's 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 uh, it, the longer it is means that there's more fields that you want to uh, enable for your searches. Now, remember that not all the data in your objects needs to be searchable. So I, I kind of went a little overboard in here. I basically uh, make everything, pretty much everything searchable, uh, but you don't have to. So uh, in here, I have a try accept um, block of code where if the index already exists, I just, uh, if the index doesn't exist, I create it. Otherwise, I just don't do anything. Uh, notice that the uh, schema it's defined in this uh, schema variable and then we have for our model brand price type description and description embeddings we have a schema field definition so uh, the ones for text fields uh, allow us to do free form text searches so in here notice that model and brand i mapped as text fields and then the price of course is mapped as a numeric field the type, uh, it's mapped as a tag field. So you can think of tag fields as specific values and you can only search for the specific values, not by prefixes, suffixes, uh, or the text containing some specific value or some other variation. So text fields are much more powerful than tag fields, but tag fields are much more efficient if you know what you're searching for. Um, and in, it, they're really good for things like uh, enumerations, uh, a fixed set of values that you know, uh, rather than freeform text. And then finally, we have the start of the show, the vector field. In our vector field, we're using the uh, brute force uh, searching method, flat. Uh, so we're going to get the most accurate matches uh, at the... At the uh, detriment of potentially performance, but it's still going to be super fast. Uh, we know that our NumPy arrays that we created are type float32. So that's why we're going to set the type to float32. Uh, the dimension of our vectors is going to be that 768 value that we extracted before into the vector dimension variable. And uh, we're going to use the cosine distance metric because remember our uh, BERT um, MS Marco models are fine-tuned for cosine. So then once we have that schema, we can create our, uh, uh, the index definition, passing the prefix of the documents that we want to index uh, via this index, and the type of collection, which is going to be JSON in our case, and then we can create the index using the uh, FT, uh, this is the FT create uh, command under this, the covers, passing the index name, uh, the schema, and the definition. So let's go ahead and uh, not forget to uh, run that. So I'm going to run that, and that should have created the, the index. If we look at the profiler, oh, well, I did not have it on, but what I can do is I can do an FT, uh, FT under, underscore list. In here, I should see the, the index, indices that I have. So uh, Simon previously created the bikes and stores uh, indexes, and I created the bikes VSS index. And you can also use the FT info and pass the index name to get information about the index. So of course, this is a lot of information. Uh, let's actually go to the slides because I have a slightly better way to, to deal with all that information. Um, so again, we talk about the definition of the vector field, the, the indexing method, again, it was flat, uh, brute force, uh, the vector type was float32, the dimension was 768, and our distance metric was cosine. 
Now let's check the state of the index in just like I did on the CLI inside of Redis Insight. I'm going to use the FT info command, uh, but in here, I'm going to just parse some specific values. I'm going to get the number of documents, uh, whether there were any indexing uh, failures, uh, how long it took to index everything, and the percentage of things that were indexed. So, of course, if there's no indexing failures, the percent should be 100. So in here, we can see that we have 111 docs were indexed, so 100%, uh, with no failures in 15.81 milliseconds. All right, so now we can do, uh, before we jump into doing our searches, we're going to do uh, first some traditional searches, just like uh, Simon did, so we can basically see uh, the index uh, in the search engine in action. So first we're going to retrieve all the bikes where the brand name is Picnetic. Uh, so in here, notice that I have a query. I use the query function to create a query with a query string. In this case, it's the um, N, um, N percent brand. So that would be the field that I'm targeting. Uh, and if you remember, brand was a uh, full text search field. And I'm going to pass the string Pignetic. And then I want to return only the fields ID, brand, model, and price. And then I'm going to use again my client with the FT uh, index command. Uh, I'm going to use the FT search command. Uh, passing my query and getting the set of docs back out. So let's go ahead and run that. And you can see here that I got, let's see, um, about 10, yeah, 10, 10 documents. And uh, notice that they all are a Pignetic brand, which is basically what our search query was. Um, so yeah, the index is working. We can do uh, searches over the semi-structured data, uh, like the text field uh, brand. Let's do a few more here, just so you can get the uh, the sense of how the querying works. Uh, so I have uh, uh, here a query where I basically look for, again, all the Pignetic bikes, but where the price is between uh, zero and 10,000. So let's go ahead and run that. And now I get only two bikes, and you can see the prices are uh, 8,359 and 7,764. All right, so now uh, let's do some semantic queries. So uh, to do our semantic queries, or basically our vector similarity queries, uh, we're going to create a collection of short query prompts. And our short query prompts, uh, you know, they're, they're between you know 20 to 25 words. And we're going to put those in a list. So here's a list of queries. You can see that we have a bike for small kids, uh, best mountain bikes for kids, uh, you know, female specific mountain bike, comfortable commuter bike, uh, vintage bike. So uh, different combinations of things that people might be looking for. So I'm going to go ahead and run that to put it in that queries variable. And then when you do vector similarity, you have to have encodings at both ends of the search process. So we have to encode our queries uh, so we can submit them to the search engine to look for uh, vectors that are similar to those. So just like we did before, I'm going to encode all the queries and put them in the variable encoded queries. And I believe we have 11 queries in there or, or 12. And uh, we're going to basically see how many we have. So yeah, we have now 11 encoded queries in there. So one of the things that I want you to uh, look at before we, we jump into that, it's how do you go ahead and, and, and visualize all this you know, similarity and, and distance uh, in a, a vector space? And one of the techniques that I typically use to visualize things, uh, it's uh, TESNY. And uh, TESNY, it's the T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. And basically what it does, it uh, reduces the dimensions of the data to uh, 2D or 3D. And then that way we can basically visualize them in a plot like the one you see on screen. So uh, tools like this are good to basically get a, a human uh, sense of whether your embeddings are working properly, the data that should be close to other data, uh, it's, it's clustered together correctly. Uh, so you can do a sanity check for your embeddings that way. So now we're going to first create a pure K and N query. And what, what is K and N? K and N, it's K nearest neighbors. 
So basically, it's a, an algorithm that allows us to basically, given a vector that we throw into the space, so in this case, the query, we're going to search the surroundings and collect the k most similar uh, neighbors to our query. So again, the goal is to find the most similar uh, items in that vector space. Uh, we, uh, k and n uses a distance between the query vector and each of the vectors in the database. And it will return the k items with the smallest distances. So it does evaluate every query against our uh, query. Uh, and again, the ones with the smallest distances are going to be the most similar ones. So now we're going to construct the, the query. And to construct the query, we use, again, the query function. But in this case, the sy syntax is a little different. If you remember the queries that we did before, uh, they were for like the brand and the range of prices. So that is the equivalent of what's inside of this parenthesis. So in this case, we're doing a query for everything. So uh, this is a way to pre-filter the query, which we're going to do later with hybrid queries. But in here, we're saying don't pre-filter anything. Uh, search against the space of all vectors in the database. And uh, we're going to use the k nearest neighbors. And we're going to uh, basically uh, collect those distances uh, in the vector um, variable. And this dollar sign query vector is the parameter that we're going to pass to the query to run the query. So this would be the, con the, the text of uh, not, not, not the text, but the embedding for our query. And that is going to be a, a, a under this alias name, vector score. Now, we're going to sort things by the vector score. So we're going to have the smallest uh, scores up top, which means those are the, the nearest neighbors. Uh, we're going to return again just the same fields that we were returning before. And uh, in Redis nowadays, the dialect uh, for the querying that enables uh, KNN searches or uh, vector searches, it's dialect number two, which probably soon will become the default. But for now, you have to um, set the dialect to number two. So uh, again, I kind of explained uh, the, the syntax of the query already, but uh, it will be here for posterity. Now, um, in order to pretty print the results, uh, seeing JSON on screen, it's a, it's a little harsh. So I created a query table function that's going to basically run the queries in bulk and then create a table of results with the top three uh, results um, displayed, which is what our KNN is doing. So you don't have to worry about this code. This is just a little bit of Python uh, glue code that I threw in there to basically run um, the queries, but you can see here that there's a loop inside of it where I take the encoded queries and I basically run them in this loop and then I collect the results and then I put the result in a, in a table. So let me go ahead and run this so it's all loaded. Perfect. And now we can run the query. So we run the query just like we ran all the queries before, but this time our function will do that on our behalf. So running the query, it's uh, using the create query table, passing the uh, query uh, in the query definition, our query prompts, and the encoded queries. So I run that, and oh my goodness, I broke it. Let's see. I potentially did not run something before, did I? Well, the demo gods have spoken. Let's see. Did I not run this correctly? Or potentially I miss one of these. Oh, yeah, I, I think I missed running the query definition. So let's run, yep, yeah, that's the uh, running the query definition. Now, uh, again, we can run this again. That's not a problem, just a definition. And now I can rerun this. There we go. Hey, nothing like uh, panicking a little bit during the presentation. <laughs> so here uh, we have a nicely formatted table uh, that basically shows the query table uh, created from our query uh, execution. So you can see here that the query best mountain bikes for kids. Uh, there's uh, three elements with their uh, score. 
and then we have the ID of the elements uh, retrieved. And then you can see here the text description that would allow you to basically discern whether the, uh, the, the search is or the search engine is actually doing the, the, right, uh, the right thing. So here is the list of all queries. And of course, uh, this uh, notebook, Jupyter Notebook presentation will be available uh, at the link at the end of the presentation. So you can basically download it and play with it yourself. So again, this is a pure KNN query. Now, like I mentioned before, this searches over the whole space of vectors. And the larger that collection of vectors, the more expensive this is going to be. So the, the, the moral of the story here is that unstructured data does not have to live in isolation. Uh, we, can, we can make our searches more efficient by taking into context the structure and unstructured data and semi-structured data in our systems. And again, that's gonna give your users a richer uh, search experience. So imagine uh, somebody comes in with a pretty fine notion for a bike, they want a specific color, uh, but some other things are based on, on a factors they don't know yet. So they might do a similarity search for, say, a bike like this one, but in red, or a bike like this one, but with fat tires. So you can see how uh, pre-filtering uh, using semi-structured structured data before the vector searches can be uh, very uh, useful to provide a rich uh, search experience. So again, the hybrid query, if you remember that uh, parenthesis asterisk, that we shown in the query definition, that's where we're gonna put the pre-filtering. So rather than having, for example, uh, the asterisk, we're gonna have something like brand pignetic, and that will basically say, uh, let's do a vector search only over the vectors uh, corresponding to the documents where the brand is pignetic. So here it's a hybrid query definition. Let's go ahead and run that. And you can see here that it looks exactly like our, like our old uh, pure um, KNN query, but we have the brand pignetic here in the parentheses of the pre-filter. So now let's gonna uh, let's go ahead and run that query. So I'm gonna uh, run our create query table, and you can see now that our queries are restricted to the brand pignetic. And again, uh, incredibly fast. All right. So now uh, there's a third type of query that you can do in uh, Redis vector similarity search. And those are range queries. And they basically uh, will retrieve items within a specific distance from the query vector. So basically imagine it's kind of like a, like a sonar uh, search. You throw in your query vector and you look in the surroundings uh, to basically catch uh, the, the, the queries uh, by a specific distance. So the, the, uh, the distance, again, it's uh, the measure of the similarity between the, uh, the query vector and the surrounding vectors. And in this case, the, the smaller the distance, the more similar the items are. So for example, uh, in here, we're gonna return the top four bikes that are within a 0.55 radius of the query. So in here, this is the, the Redis search uh, raw vector definition. So you can see here, uh, so you can get an idea of what we did or, or what the Redis Pi library did for us. Uh, here we have the FT search command against the specific index. We have our um, vector definition uh, and we have the, uh, the field vector. We're gonna search with a vector range uh, passing the query vector. And we're gonna yield the distance as the vector score. Then we're gonna sort the whole thing uh, by that vector score in ascending order. And we're gonna grab just the four top uh, elements. Again, we're, we're using the uh, dialect number two. And we're passing uh, four params. The range, uh, which is 055, which is gonna be injected into this dollar range um, uh, parameter holder. And then the query vector, which is our you know binary uh, encoded uh, embedding, and that's gonna go into the query vector parameter right here. So let's see what that looks like in Python. So in Python, we have basically, again, uh, a use the query function. We have our vector field, uh, basically the same text that we saw in the FT search raw command inside of that 
uh, query definition. Then we have the sorting by the vector score, the fields that we want to return, the pag pagination, which we want uh, the first four elements, and the specific dialect. So let me go ahead and run that. And then let's go ahead and run the query. And in here now we have uh, the bike for small kids uh, query. Um, that's a query that we passed to the specific. So we passed query number one in here. They didn't want to have a gigantic table, this one. And, um, and you can see those are all the ones we're doing 0.55 of the query vector. All right, so how do you uh, go ahead and uh, visualize those high dimensional uh, embeddings? I, I brought in a system that actually I find very useful, which is this uh, part of the uh, TensorFlow uh, project. And here, this is embeddings for words. So this is using the, the common word to vec um, embeddings. And you can see that we have this rotating, floating mass of points. And this was actually generated using PCA, which is similar to the TESNY technique that I used before. Uh, we can even go to TESNY. Uh, let's switch to TESNY and use um, what I normally use. And now it's basically doing the dimensionality reduction so that we can then visualize our embeddings. And you can see these are for different words. So let me, uh, let me step into this mass of embeddings and then we can look around. So you can see here that there is, uh, and sometimes it's hard to control it, but you can see here we have Earl, Madison, all kinds of different values in here. So it's a, it's a nice uh, way to basically explore your embedding spaces and find out if things actually are getting placed in that space in a way that makes sense for the results you're looking for. All right, so uh, uh, to recap, the, the tools and techniques available nowadays to deal with unstructured data have evolved exponentially. Uh, we have all these amazing machine learning models, ones that you can train yourself, and a very large collection of pre-trained models for pretty much every purpose that you, you might have in mind, uh, including all those large language models. So you can do very amazing things with things like uh, GPT-4 and, um, and uh, YOLO vision models, uh, so yeah, there's a, there's a whole universe of, of uh, embeddings to be created out there for different purposes. Redis, again, memory first approach makes it a perfect fit for vector similarity searches. And uh, Redis uh, has native support for these vector searches um, over hash uh, objects or JSON objects or JSON documents. And again, Redis, it's a well-established database that pairs uh, or provides a very powerful search engine. And now you can basically treat vectors as any other data type in your collection. So your searches can basically span the whole uh, gamut of your data. Uh, again, with, with the unparalleled performance that you get from Redis. Okay, so uh, if you're interested in playing with this presentation, this uh, was developed as a, a Jupyter Notebook uh, using the RISE framework so I could show it as slides. And uh, it's under our GitHub Redis developer organization uh, under the redis-bike-co uh, URL. And uh, also, if you want to learn more about Redis, come to Redis University, where we have uh, created amazing courses uh, to learn about all of Redis's capabilities, data structures, um, and, and uh, make the most out of Redis in your organization or project. And uh, thank you to Simon for the uh, great first uh, portion of the, the uh, lecture. And, uh, and I am Brian, so in, on behalf of Simon and myself, thank you very much for being here, and we hope to see you soon.